My name is Sarah Alger. I'm the director of the Russell Museum. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We're very excited to have our guests tonight. Uh, I'm just going to offer, well, one housekeeping uh, note. I'm going to be passing through the audience a clipboard. If you would like to sign up for our mailing list, uh, email list, so you can keep up with other lectures and other events that we're doing here, feel free to do so. And with that, I'd like to, uh, to introduce our first our next introducer, I'll say. Uh, the co-sponsor of our lecture series this week is the Mass General Research Institute. And here to introduce tonight's speakers is Dr. Susan Slagenhop. She's not only a professor of neurology, but also the scientific director of the Research Institute. So please welcome Dr. Slagenhop. great to have all of you come out this evening. Before I introduce our speakers tonight, I'd like to take a moment just to tell you about the Mass General Research Institute. So by a show of hands, how many of you know that Mass General actually has the largest federally funded hospital-based research program in the country? So that's good. pretty good. That is pretty good. Um, but we want everybody to raise their hands when, by the time you leave here. Um, it's one of the reasons that the fact that um, not all of you raised your hands. This is one of the reasons that MGH has launched the Research Institute. Um, it's acts, the Research Institute's goal is to act as the front door for promoting our research enterprise. Research at MGH is a vast undertaking. There are more than 6,000 individuals at the hospital who are working in research. They're scattered across more than 30 institutes, centers, and departments, and now we are all united under one institute with the goal of improving human health. Despite the remarkable scientific advances that are made on a daily basis here at Mass General, federal funding for research has essentially declined over the last decade. Competition for individual grants has become extremely difficult, and more of the funding base has shifted from basic science or fundamental discovery to outcomes-based research. The Research Institute was founded to promote, guide, and support the vast research enterprise here at the hospital. It was also created to help our researchers continue their work in these challenging times. Research has been part of the hospital's mission for almost 200 years since its founding. And research is why the treatment you get here at Mass General will be better tomorrow than the treatment you get today. It's the researchers partnered with our physicians on a daily basis that really bring new medical discoveries to the forefront. So clearly, women have been instrumental in moving research forward at the hospital. And they, are, they occupy many leadership roles at the hospital. If you look at the exhibit, and I hope after the talk she'll take a few minutes to look at the exhibit, you can read about just a sampling of women. There's no way we could have possibly highlighted all of the remarkable women who have participated in research at Mass General, but this is just a sampling of women that have participated here at the hospital. And tonight, we'll hear from two very special women who are not only physicians, but also journalists. Dr. Suzanne Coven, there we go, has practiced primary care internal medicine at MGH for more than 20 years. Earlier this year, she was appointed writer in resident for the Division of General Internal Medicine at Mass General. Her essays, articles, blogs, and reviews have appeared in the Boston Globe, the New England Journal of Medicine, the New Yorker.com, Psychology Today, the LA Review of Books, and many other publications. Dr. Malika Marshall <laughs> treats children and adults at the Massachusetts General Hospital Chelsea Urgent Care Clinic. The Emmy Award-winning physician journalist has been a television correspondent for over a decade. That is why she looks so familiar to all of you. <laughs> In addition to recently serving as the medical contributor to Katie Couric's daytime talk show, Dr. Marshall has returned to WBZ News as the regular health reporter. Before that, she served as a regular medical contributor to the CBS Early Show, the CBS Evening News, New England Cable News. She's also made recent appearance, appearances on Al Jazeera America, ABC News Now, and Fox and & Friends. Moderating their discussion this evening is Carrie Goldberg, the co-host of WBUR's Common Health blog, She's been the Boston Bureau Chief of the New York Times, a staff Moscow correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, and a health and science reporter for the Boston Globe. 
Please join me in welcoming these remarkable women this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, woo, sorry. <laughs> um, and I am so looking forward to this conversation, just kind of letting our curly hair down. <laughs> Tell them I usually have much curlier hair. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Flat irons and curling irons do yeah. wonders. Um, so I'd like to start with a question that makes me sheepish because it's a sort of a stereotypical women's question. And I would like to say that I would ask Atul Gawande this same question. <laughs> In fact, I would ask him how he can possibly do all the things that he does. And it's a very similar question for, for both of you. It's hard enough to be just a reporter or a writer or just a doctor or just have a personal life, and yet you're somehow managing to do all of it. And I think that it's the great conundrum for women of our generation. How the hell do you do it all? And so, Suzanne, do you want to start? Uh, well, I think the simple answer is that I don't do it all. Uh, somebody once asked me this question uh, a few years ago and said, gosh, you just, just have it so together. And I, I was at work in clinic and I said, look at my feet. I had two different shoes. <laughs> So, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, I wonder if I was limping. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is that, um, you know, I think most of us do what we really want to do. And I really wanted to do the things that I'm doing. Um, there's a lot of things that I don't really want to do that I somehow never find time to do. Uh, and, and the second thing is, you know, I just had a lot of help and support and um, a really great family and really great colleagues. But the third thing, kind of more specific to the fields of medicine and writing, are that as time has gone on, they have seemed less and less like different careers to me. Uh, they have uh, merged. And so, you know, it doesn't feel like, you know, casting such a wide net. I no longer feel like I'm doing all those different things. I'm doing this one thing. And, and very conveniently, my children grew up. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does that happen? Eventually. <laughs> <Lord. Yeah. laughs> okay. Um, you're catching me on a particularly bad day to ask this question. And I think it's a very valid question um, that you should ask and that everybody should ask themselves. Because I think that women are in a unique position of really, really having to balance it all. I and mean, I think about my husband, and I love my husband dearly, and he's been a great partner, and he's a great father. But he's not worried about getting his work done while trying to remember which play date your middle child had today and if you filled out the pink slip that goes with him to school and oh my son on the way here called to tell me he has two you know spelling tests on Wednesday and a math test on Thursday and he expects me to come home and help him study. Um, I'm also part of that squeeze generation which is why I'm encouraged that at some point the kids do grow up because you know, I've got three young kids. I've got a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a ten-year-old. Um, and they're all, you know, at that age, very needy, and they all want their mama. And daddy's kind of, you know, sloppy seconds if mommy's not around. Um, and I also have sick and aging parents. Um, I have a father right now who's critically ill um, at the rhythm. And um, so, you know, I'm, I, my phone's over there under my coat, and I'm, you know, is anybody texting me? Is the nurse trying to call me? I had to consent him for dialysis today. So, um, so it's particularly tough for me right now, because not only am I balancing two careers that for some reason for me still seem very separate of, of being a, a clinician and um, reporting the news, um, but I also am a, am a mom that I take um, as a job very seriously. I'm, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, and women have that unique burden. I'm sorry to say that most men don't. 
Um, and it's particularly apropos that I am in the middle of working on a story that was spawned by research done here at Mass General, talking about why is it that women seem to suffer more from stress-related stress illnesses, from anxiety and from panic disorder and from depression. And there is a physiological reason for it, and there seems to be a hormonal reason for it. So I think it sort of gives validation to the fact that we do try to do it all, and we don't always succeed. And I often forget that pink slip or forget to send lunch on Fridays with my kids. Um, but like you said, they're all things I really want to do, and I want to be involved. And I don't want my kids to turn to someone else. I still want them to come to me. And I want to do a really good job at, um, at both of my careers. Um, so it's a struggle, and right now I'm, you know, I, I talk about an apple cart. Some people talk about the the duck with the feet that are paddling so quickly underwater, and it looks like the duck is, you know, moving smoothly along, but underneath the feet are rapidly going. But for me, I talk about a perfectly balanced apple cart that I have all these apples in my cart, and if like one apple is pulled out or one apple is added, they all kind of tumble down, um, and so I kind of feel like I'm almost about to tumble right now, but still holding it together. <laughs> The, the other thing to be said is that, um, and I'm sure you feel the same way, is that you know it's an incredible privilege to have this problem. You know, it's an incredible privilege to have, you know, so many people you love in your life. It's an incredible privilege to have so many things you want to do, um, and you know, most people on this planet don't have the privilege of even. Know, thinking about those kind of options, so it, you know, or the help, help as you mentioned, or the I help. Mean, I've got great babysitters and I've got great but, parents to help out. And but those were hard years. I, I I tell my patients all the time. There were a lot of years where I had my mother on the landline and my teenage daughter on the cell phone at the same time, <laughs> and also doing two other careers at the same time as so, well. But so. So let's come back to these issues later because I think the even the, the, the dreaded work-life balance question is a truly central one for our lives. But 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 let's let's move over to the to the, the dual career question. And I thought we might start with a concrete example from recent news, which was not so recent, but in the last year or so, which was the Ebola crisis. And I would just wonder, Malcolm, maybe you start. So what was your, because you're both a physician and a reporter, how would you say that informed your treatment of that story? So again, it was sort of two-pronged. Um, at the station, I am responsible for knowing everything health, right? I've trained and I'm double boarded in internal medicine and pediatrics, so those really are my areas of expertise, but I am not an infectious disease specialist, or an ophthalmologist, or a pulmonologist. Um, but as far as the station's concerned, I'm, I'm a doctor, so therefore I'm supposed to be like, what is Ebola? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I like, remember, I remember something about boards and hemorrhages. And, you know, and so you, you are responsible for as quickly as you possibly can getting up to speed on things that you know very little about. And that used to really stress me out at the beginning of my journalism career. Like I can't, I don't, I just, I, I feel like I need to know everything about everything. And the truth of the matter is, you don't, because you, you know, what you're trying to do is digest very complicated information for the public and sort of regurgitate it in a way that is understandable and relatable, um, and calm people's fears. Like I honestly feel like my role is to be the voice of reason and provide perspective. And yes, I know the reporters are talking about all this and everybody's scared that everybody's gonna bleed and nobody wants to go on a, on a train and all that stuff. <laughs> but come on guys, it's gonna be okay. The vast, vast majority of us are never gonna come into contact with it or ever be faced with it. So, you know, over the years I have sort of learned not to panic when something unusual comes up and to just quickly do as much research as I can and then try to, um, Sort of, you know, try to pretend that I'm in the clinic room with that patient who comes to me and says, "Should I not take the tea?" Mm -hmm. And that's like, no, well, you should take the tea. I want to take some hand sanitizer with you, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm here a little bit under false pretenses. Uh, uh, I guess it's a bit late to 
<laughs> You'll all get your money. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm not really a journalist. I'm a columnist and an essayist. And so I had this, you know, when Ebola came around, I just kind of had this platform uh, from which to sort of, you know, think about it in, in whatever context I wanted to think about it, which was a great luxury. What struck me about it was that it all seemed very, very familiar. And what seemed familiar about it to me was that it reminded me an awful lot of AIDS in the 80s. That there was, uh, you know, when an epidemic comes, whether it's uh, Ebola or AIDS or H1N1 or whatever else uh, is going to come, or SARS, there is an immediate demonization of the other. I mean, this is what happened with polio. You know, it's got to be the Italian immigrants. Or maybe it's the Jewish immigrants. Or maybe it's black people. You know, if it's the de demonization and fear of the other. Uh, and, um, you know, when AIDS, as it was then called, because HIV hadn't even been discovered yet, there was this kind of conflation of fear, gay men, patients, uh, and, you know, people who use IV drugs, uh, and sadly, even within the medical community, a feeling that somehow this wasn't going to happen to us, that we were different from that. Uh, and I just got very interested in that. I got very interested in, um, you know, some of the press around Ebola. And if, if you remember, there was a, a lot with the, um, you know, sort of the, that doctor who had Ebola, and then he went bowling in Brooklyn, and <laughs> you remember that? And, uh, and then a couple of years before that, with H1N1, the people walking around the street in masks, and it's probably the Mexican immigrants, and, you know, all of this script, which is a very, very old script. I mean, if you read Camus, The Plague, it's the same script. Um, if you read um, Hippocrates, it's the same uh, script. So I got very interested in all of that, and um, and um, and I wrote about it based on my memory of a very particular story. Um, you know what what Malika does is also very story driven, uh, but in a different way. Anyway, so that story that I remembered, which was of a doctor who got AIDS and was um, became a pariah. Uh, contracted AIDS in the hospital, became a pariah, um, became this sort of entry point to think about all this stuff. It's a very different approach. Yeah. So let's back all the way up to career path. Did you start out, Suzanne, maybe you take this one first. Did you both start out knowing you wanted to be doctors and then only later come to writing or reporting? Or did you know from the get-go that you wanted to do both? And and, and does the writing and reporting uh, serve to help you through the medicine somehow? Yeah. Um, well, um, I told this story, believe it or not, at Harvard Medical School, so I guess the, the cat's out of the bag. Um, I was an English major in college. I, I uh, started and dropped intro chemistry three times, <laughs> you know, right before that deadline, you know. Uh, and I had myself pegged as an English major kind of person who really wanted to be a doctor, but that was an impossibility. <clears throat> and then finally I, I sort of got it together uh, to go to medical school. And um, the truth of the matter is um, I'm not fundamentally not all that interested in science or even in medicine. <laughs> what I'm interested in. <laughs> what I'm interest have I got your attention? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did that. I had to flare for the dramatic. <laughs> what I'm interested in is stories. That's what 
I'm interested in. That's what I was interested in when I was reading Victorian novels as an English major, and that's what I'm still interested in. You know, I mean, it's a very strange job I have. Think about it. You know, I, I meet people and um, shake hands, and I ask them to tell me all their secrets, and then they do. <laughs> and then they take their clothes off. It's a, I mean, it's a, I mean, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very intimate thing, and, 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 and it's a deeply human thing, and I, I, you know, what I felt over time is that I still insist that what I learned in college reading novels has, has served me much better as a primary care doctor than what I learned when I finally did take intro chemistry, which I, I don't even know what it is, <laughs> let alone remember any of it, and, yeah. and, and I don't need it. So um, luckily for me, as time went on, I know, Nick, don't go home and say, she doesn't care about medicine. <laughs> yeah. as, as time has gone, gone on, I've been very fortunate that there's been this movement in medicine toward uh, medical humanities and narrative medicine. And, you know, our division in our hospital now has a writer in residence. We have a monthly uh, you know, book discussion group for doctors, nurses, and administrators. Who would have ever thought such a thing? Uh, so it's it's been a real coming together. Believe me, when I took the MCATs, this is not what I planned. <laughs> well, and the growing recognition that bedside manner is so important and that um, patient satisfaction so depends on the human relationship, right? even more. Right. I mean, a, a, you know, a story that I've told many times, but I think it's worth repeating, is there's a there's a course at Harvard Medical School that takes place right before the students start. It's called um, ITP, Introduction to the Profession. And one of the assignments, these, I mean, these students are new, you know, as new as can be. And they go to patients' bedsides, and they are told they can ask anything. But what they have to ask is, what advice would you give me as I enter this profession? Mm -hmm. And of course, what they're quaking in their boots about is that they won't know enough. Or they won't be competent enough. They won't know enough stuff. They won't know how to do enough stuff. But that's never what the patients say they want from them. What the patients say 100% of the time, not 99, 100% of the time is, I want you to listen to me. And so, you know, that's a, that's a, a powerful skill. It's not, you know, joking aside, the chemistry, the physiology, all of that is very important. But, but the listening, um, the paying attention, that's also very important. And, you know, there's now recognition that humanities can offer that. And does writing make you a better listener? I think it does. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it does. I, you know, writing is about paying attention. It's about trying to figure out the right word, how to say something in the way you really mean it, how to convey. And um, I think, just as most people will say, becoming a writer makes you a better reader. I think it has made me a better listener. I mean, that sounds so like pretentious and boastful, but I, you know, I, I really do think it, it has. I will say this, and I could say this without feeling pretentious and boastful. It's renewed my joy in medicine. I am not a burned out primary care doctor. <laughs> And it's I should, should write I your way out. I should be in a museum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it's it's it, it's brought the joy of medicine back to me. I said I wasn't interested. I didn't say I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> Malika, talk about your path. Um, my path was really not wanting to do anything my parents wanted. Me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Again, not for the love of medicine, but because 
My mother was a journalist um, and on television, and when you're the daughter of someone who's on television, which I'm quickly learning from my six-year-old, you don't care that your mother's on television. Like, who cares? I mean, I got to go to some cool places, but you know, for me, it was like her job. Um, and when she traveled, um, she was on, you know, this vice presidential campaign, and she was traveling here with the president or whatever. And it's like, good, go. It means I don't have to make my bed. I don't have to brush my teeth. My father never made me do anything. <laughs> um, and so when it came time to sort of decide, okay, well, what are you going to do with your life? Like I was like, well, I don't want to do what my mom does. That looks awful. And I don't want to do what my dad wants me to do. Like his dream was for me to go to MIT and be an, an engineer or a physicist. And I was like, that's not going to happen. Um, lawyers seemed like they had to do a lot of reading of very tedious texts. And I just was not into that. So I was like, doctor, right? Um, <laughs> At the same time, my grandparents were becoming ill sort of in those formative years for me, like you know, 15, 16, 17. So three out of four of them had prolonged illnesses in hospitals. And my parents took me um, to see them and exposed me to all of that. And you know, I was there when we turned off life support with my grandmother. And so I think it sort of made me feel comfortable with the whole idea of being, um, being in a hospital and seeing how the way that people took care of my grandparents. And so I, you know, I think it's a combination. My mother still say it's the doctor kit when I got when I was four. <laughs> um, but it was a combination of things that sort of led me down the path to medicine. And it wasn't until I was in medical school that I thought, I really like to write and I really like to speak. Um, and there was a doctor by the name of Dr. Dean Adell, who some of you may have seen other things, but he was an ophthalmologist in San Francisco where I was in med school, and he had this weekly show, and he would talk about things related to hearts and, and things related to gynecology, but he was an eye doctor, and I thought, what's an eye doctor doing talking about all these things? Like, eyes very different from, like, the, you know. <laughs> um, but it sort of sparked an interest, like, if, and he spoke so eloquently and so authoritatively about all these things, and I thought, well, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. And so I decided, even though my love was for pediatrics and kids, that I want to do that. Like, I don't know if I feel comfortable just doing kids and talking about coronary disease, so, okay, fine, I'll do adult medicine, too. And um, it just so happened that Harvard um, had a really cool combined program at, our, at Mass General Brigham and Children's. And so that's what I did. Um, and you know, I was here for four years, and when you're in residency, you can't think of anything else other than your next meal and when you're going to be able to sleep. Um, but I befriended a nurse, and this is the story. I always tell these, you know, these medical students, these newbies, whatever you do, you always be kind to the people you work with, especially the nurses. And so I had learned that lesson early on. And so one of the nurses that I worked with, her husband was an editor at the Globe, and he golfed with the head of Channel 4, and so my, you know, my interest in journalism got passed on unbeknownst to me to the sky on the golf course, and so I got a, got a call at the Brigham ICU when I was on call, and they said we're looking for a, a doctor to report our health news. So that's sort of how I, strangely and serendipitously, ended up um, in this career. But in terms of, you know, you're, you, I think you're right. Like, I think when it comes to being a good doctor, it's not how much medicine you know. It's not the chemistry or the physiology that you took in in, in um, medical school, it's it's the compassion. And I don't think everybody is necessarily well suited to be a physician. They can be incredibly brainy and know about all of everything out there in terms of medicine, but unless you can connect with a patient, as you were speaking about, um, I don't think you're a very effective doctor. And it wasn't until I became a patient, um, I went through seven rounds of um, in vitro fertilization to have my three kids. Actually, two of them. The other one just kind of spontaneously <laughs> appeared. Um, but, but it was hard. I mean, it's a horrible thing to go through for anybody out there who has. Um, and all of a sudden, the doctor became the patient, and I realized what was important to patients. Again, not that the cycle worked or didn't work. It was the call that said, once again, that I wasn't pregnant. How kind and lovely was that person and supportive. Um, and now, again, with, you know, sick parents, you know, I was talking to a bunch of doctors yesterday about my father. 
and it wasn't the attendings in renal and rheumatology and all the people who had all the knowledge about the different body systems. It was the second year medicine resident who was so kind and so compassionate. And when I started to tear up, she started to tear up. And I told her, I said, you are going to make an amazing doctor one year. I don't care how much you know. Like, you're listening to me. You hear me. Um, so I would say that being a medical journalist um, has in some ways made me a better doctor because it has forced me to take very complicated medical language and boil it down to a 30 second sound bite, which I think has served me well in a clinic room with a patient because I do urgent care so I literally have 10 or 15 minutes to examine a patient, diagnose a patient, treat a patient, and explain what they should do if they get sicker. Um, but I also think that being a doctor has way more benefited me as a journalist um, and being a patient and being a mom. Um, those things have sort of shaped me into what I think is a, a, a better doctor than I was 15 years ago when I thought I knew everything and knew all the latest studies and it just passed my boards. I didn't know diddly back then. <laughs> but I, I, I want to emphasize that it's, um, it's, it's not as though uh, being compassionate and knowing things are at odds with each other. Right. And you know, in fact, you do want your doctor to know. <laughs> yeah. Or at least know where to yeah. find yeah. the yes. information. Well, right. I mean, it's not like if you, you know, if you've got a smiley face, you don't need to know anything. I mean, but uh, I think what is underestimated is the extent to which um, Really, uh, really hearing a story is diagnostically and therapeutically valuable. These things are not, I tell the medical students, this isn't like, you know, like fuzzy after school special stuff. And they look at me and they say, what? Because they don't know what an after school special is. <laughs> 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 oh, pray with breast Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, this is not like sort of extracurricular whipped cream. This is, is really part of the process. And so I don't want to leave the impression, as I'm sure of it is, that, you know, just go to a doctor who doesn't know anything as long as they're <laughs> nice. It's going to all work out. It's, it's, I, it's underestimated how powerfully those two things sink. Well, of course, we're also lucky to live in an area where any doctor you go to is going to have the, the education and, and the knowledge. I mean, we look where we are. Um, so that sort of is a given for most of the institutions where you're going to be looking for a doctor in the Boston area. But I think having that ability to personally connect with people is something you can't always teach and I think is really fundamental to being a, a good physician. Um, I just want to say a word about the format, so I'll ask probably a couple, three more questions, and then you might want to start thinking of your own questions. There will be um, 15 or 20 minutes to, to ask questions and have a more general conversation. So I had the first question that came to my mind, actually, when I thought about this panel was um, the, the imperative to do no harm, which you naturally have a, as a physician, but which can be um, a very daunting thing as a reporter or writer, because you're sending what you do out to the general public and you can't control how it lands the same way that you can keep an eye on a patient. So can, can you address that? I'll well, maybe start. Um, what do you worry about in terms of potential harms as you do your reporting? I mean, you definitely worry that someone's going to take what you say as the word of God and go and change their lives in a fundamental way that could be harmful. So, I mean, you learn sort of nuances, how to say, but before you, you know, before you stop your calcium, make sure you have your doctor. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, this could, you know, there are a lot of caveats. This could, should, may, maybe, maybe not, maybe could. <laughs> you leave <know, laughs> yourself, you know, yourself a lot of wiggle room, especially because, you know, people get so frustrated. Like, one day you're telling them, like, watch the caffeine, it's not good for you, and then the next study comes out, and it's like, actually, yeah, as much as you want. Right, there's the risk of diabetes or whatever. So, I constantly feel like I'm contradicting something that I may have said just a year ago, but I remind the producers and the anchors, like, science is in flux. Like, it's, it's a moving entity. Um, and so the more information we get, we may have different recommendations from time to time. Um, 
Now I've forgotten what the original question was. <laughs> <laughs> the do no harm. Oh, do no harm. Right, right. Yeah. right. So you like, yeah, so I leave myself a lot of wiggle room. I have to say, I am, after doing the journalism piece for so long, I feel generally comfortable, although I will tell you one story. Um, but my biggest fear is actually doing harm one-on-one -on -one with the patient. Oh, really? I mean, I lose sleep at night. I never lose sleep at night by something I may have said on TV. Um, but if I've seen a patient, I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm really worried. Like, I don't know if what I did for them was okay. Like, I will be up at 2 o'clock in the morning worried, sick, about whether I have mismanaged or mishandled someone. Because you feel ultimately responsible for that one individual, whereas when you're on TV, it just kind of goes out there into the ether. And, now it lives forever on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be the case. My, my producer used to say, Nellie, don't worry. It's like, who's gone? It's, well, it's now. Yep. It's, it's never gone. <laughs> uh, but the one, the one time I did get in trouble, um, which could have been somewhat catastrophic, was a piece we were doing years ago when there was still maybe some question about the relationship of the measles vaccine and autism. Okay? This was, again, 14 years ago. And that Lancet article was the still way living and breathing that has soon, since been, you know, found to be false. But that was there was always that study that people would refer back to. And so we were doing a piece on how important the MMR vaccine was. And I was working with a producer who I didn't realize was sort of an anti-vaccine um, person. And and she was a friend of mine, and she's a good person, but we obviously differ on that. Um, and so we had put together a piece that I thought was a responsible piece. And after I had tracked it, which meant I went to the recording studio and recorded my voice and I thought everything was said and done, they went back and edited it because they had to shorten it for time. And so they took out key pieces, pictures of kids with measles, important pieces that talked about how devastating measles could be um, in rare cases. And it changed the tenor of the piece and it aired without me seeing it. And I got a call from a doctor at Children's Hospital who was like, what the heck have you done? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I went back. And I, I mean, I cried for days um, because I was mortified by what if what I had done had convinced people out there not to get their kids vaccinated. Um, so I have since learned <laughs> to always See the make sure the yeah. final product. And now I don't even have a producer. I write my own stuff. So I know that you know the buck stops with me. But that was a very important lesson to learn that it, you you could do something that could mislead people and could lead to you know death and destruction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mine is a little different because I'm usually not sort of uh, you know disseminating what's called news you can use you know you know sort of factual information that people are using to educate themselves about. Help. It's more sort of perspective, but what I worry about is this. Um, you know, uh, uh, my stuff tends to be very personal and very anecdotal, uh, deliberately so. Uh, and yet, you know, we live in an age where there are a lot of bad anecdotes. Yeah. Like, for example, we have a uh, a presidential candidate of a major party who knows a child who, who, may who, who, you know, who, you know, so you can say something like, well, I met somebody who got autism from the measles vaccine, and you say that in a public forum, and, you know, somehow that N of one, if it even was a one, you know, so, so I sometimes worry that the anecdote could be interpreted as uh, being meant to be too representative. The other thing, of course, I worry about is I tell stories from my practice. Yeah, how do you handle that? <laughs> uh, I always ask permission. I, I would never want any, and even if I use a pseudonym, I never want somebody to see their story um, in a publication without their permission. Um, you know, one time I, I wrote a, a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I felt quite certain this particular patient did read on a regular basis, uh, and I, I changed her name, and I changed her details, I changed everything about it, so much so that I thought, well, just this once, I won't. And just to reality, ask 
to ask. Yeah. Just to reality check it, I said to my husband, you know, if you didn't, she's never going to read it, she's going to change the details, I did it. And he said, well, you're asking, therefore, you're not sure. You have to, right? If you're asking, you have to. I wrote down her phone number and I put on a little piece of paper and I carried it around in my pocket for about two weeks. <laughs> because in truth, the anecdote I told wasn't entirely, it wasn't unflattering, but it wasn't flattering. <laughs> and so then she happened to come in and I sort of skirted around it. I said, you know, sometimes we talk about symptoms that could possibly be interpreted as maybe being psychologically, I'm <laughs> dancing. And she said, oh, you're not the first doctor wanted to write about me. <laughs> <laughs> put me in my <laughs> and then, of course, I have patients who say to me completely spontaneously, are you writing this down? Don't ever write about me. Because <laughs> your patients all know that you write. They all know. They all know. It's kind of become a part of our relationship. I, I hope in a positive way, but, you know, it's a worry. Uh, I, I had a, the great privilege of interviewing Oliver Sacks when he turned 80 a couple of years ago. And I said to him, um, so, you know, what do you think about this writing about patients thing? And he'd been doing it for 50 years. And he said in his wonderful British accent, which I won't attempt to imitate, <laughs> he said, I always feel on the moral knife edge. So he didn't always ask. No, he always asked, but he always worried. Worry that whether it was whether it was the right thing, uh, whether <coughs> using your patience as writing material mm -hmm. is a hundred percent okay. And I think if you're a doctor who writes about patients, not you know not in a journalistic sense, but if you're a doctor who writes about patients and you're not uncomfortable about that, um, you probably should. Be. <laughs> Oliver yeah. Sacks was. Yeah, and uh, yet from the reader's point of view, it's such wonderful stuff. <laughs> you know, it's so close to the bone. Really. Yes, and, and you know, um, the most personal piece I ever wrote about anybody was a patient on their deathbed asked me to write about them dying and about how helpful palliative care had been to them. The first sentence of this column was, Janice is dying. And she was very gratified by the emails that came in about people who responded to her story. And, uh, <coughs> you know, I don't think it's self serving to say that, I mean, I think her family would tell you that that was uh, a very powerful experience at the end of her life. So you can actually heal by writing, too, sometimes. You can help, help by writing. Well, that, I mean, that, that's a, a, a very well-established thing for the writer themselves, but also, you know, reading and writing are very therapeutic. All kinds of crazy studies about this. Asthmatics who journal about their asthma have fewer asthma attacks. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, I can ask a couple more questions. If you need more time to think, or does anybody have a question already? Yes, and then. I'd love to hear about your book group and what books you're reading. Okay. Can you hear the question in the back? Your book group and the books you're reading. Was that for Suzanne? Yes. Okay. Oh, is this a plant? This plant? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I've been writing this group, book group here for about eight years, and it gets crazier and crazier. <laughs> because here's what we sort of figured out is that if you limit it only to books about medicine, literature about medicine, you know, you try out the same things everybody's reading. You know, they're great books, but you try out the same things. If you just 
bring out great literature, it's speaking to something deeply human, and therefore it it sparks, you know, conversations that you know people who work in the hospital are very tuned into. So last week we talked about Thomas Mann's Death in Venice. And as I told people, if you haven't read difficult German fiction over cold pizza <laughs> in a hospital cafeteria, you haven't lived. <laughs> so much of that, the last scene when the old man is rouging his cheeks and dyeing his hair and and you know, trying to be what he isn't, and it got into a whole big discussion about plastic surgery and about age and youth, and it was just absolutely wonderful. The time before that, and I won't, I won't go back all the way to eight years, but I, I could. Uh, we talked about um, uh, some uh, work by Claudia Rankine and uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, and James Baldwin, and we talked about racism in medicine. There is something about a literature that provides this really safe space in which to have really hard conversations. It works every time. It's like it's like a card trick. It's, it's quite amazing. But thanks for asking. You should write those scenes. <laughs> you should write some of the book club scenes. That would be cool. And, yeah. and doing. <laughs> yeah. So in the back there, and then you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's you know infinite subjects you could write about, and uh, you know in, in terms of public health, there's diabetes and obesity and opiates and so forth. But I'm wondering uh, two things. One, how do you choose, and do you have any intention, or or have you written about firearms? Is that for both doctors? Probably. Yes. Doctors. Um, Both. Both. Yeah. Take a turn. <laughs> I'm like Suzanne, I'm sort of at the mercy of the producers and the, the television station. I mean, I do some of my own writing on the side, but in terms of what what types of things I report on television, um, you know, TV is very ratings driven. So, um, you know, you really, in order to get the producers to sign on to an idea, you have to make a compelling case that eyeballs are going to want to tune in to see it. Excuse me. Um, so I remember years ago, like anything having to do with sex, alcohol, um, uh, anything, Malika will do it. <laughs> you can find anything involving sex and alcohol and maybe the combination, you are on, on board, right? Um, so it was a lot harder to get people <laughs> to let me talk about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and um, so it's a balancing act. People always say, do you pick your stories? Or do you what I do is I come to the morning meeting every morning with a list of stories. Some that I, I'm sure that they're going to like, others that I want them to hear about and consider. And you know, sometimes I get some of those stories reported, but I certainly have you know, more supervision than Suzanne does and less freedom. So, uh, I have no supervision. <laughs> so, so clearly. Uh, um, so, when I, I, I was in a, a wonderful uh, position writing uh, the Monthly Globe column, I could write about anything I wanted. And people said, month after month, how do you think of a new topic? It was very easy. I thought about something that made me really uncomfortable when I wrote about that. So, here's an example. Um, uh, a medical assistant handed me an opiate prescription on one of my patients who has chronic pain and as, you know, in the privacy of my office, and as I was signing it, I was like, ugh. And then I said to myself, what's that about? What, what's ugh about relieving somebody's pain? And so I wrote about my attitudes toward narcotic prescriptions physicians' attitudes towards narcotic prescriptions, uh, and so forth. You asked about writing about gun control. I have waded into those waters. Um, uh, it earned me a spot on a, uh, a conservative website where um, I was called a um, 
fembot liptard who don't know jack about firearms. You <laughs> <laughs> should get the t-shirt. <laughs> A fembot <laughs> liptard libtard who don't know jack about firearms. And, and also, uh, and also uh, a death threat from someone from South Dakota who phoned her office and said what she was planning to do when she drove across the country, and, which she didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, that, uh, this may have been a, another question that's going to come up, but it's really tough um, because the, the truth of the matter is, um, the big issues in medicine today are social and political issues. You know, it's not like the good old days where you could invent penicillin and, you know, and everybody was better to you know, figure out how to do an appendectomy and have a patient live and, you know, um, write about that. But I mean, what are the big issues in medicine today? Obesity, addiction. Poverty, gun violence. Um, I mean, if you're looking at what, what people are suffering from and dying from, their thing, smoking, not so much anymore, but smoking. Um, you look at what people are suffering from and dying from now, there are things that many people do not feel are doctor's business to be writing about or even talking with their patients about. You know, there was a law in Florida that said that pediatricians could not ask um, the patient's parents whether there were firearms in the home and whether they were being stored safely because it was felt to be um, crossing the line over into something that was not medical. So, yes, it's, it's, that's a really, a really tricky one. Can I piggyback off of that, only because it comes back to a question that I think you had posed before we met today. And that was, how do, you, how do you talk about controversial things like that, like gun control? Um, and in my situation, even though I'm a reporter, I always say that I'm a doctor who plays a reporter on TV because I've never been trained as a journalist. Wait, you're, you're not a journalist either? No. <laughs> Both here under false pretenses. <laughs> Are you? Yes. Really? Really? <laughs> right, well, I have not been formally trained. But anyway, you, you, you know, journalists are supposed to be objective, right? They're supposed to just present the facts and not really have an opinion about anything. I mean, my mother struggled with that for years because she had very strong political views about things, but when she was an anchor at ABC News, she could not let those be known. You can't donate to political um, campaigns and things like that because you are supposed to be objective. I have found that I'm in a unique position, which I like, because I'm not really a journalist, because I'm a doctor who's reporting health news. I'm expected to have an opinion. I'm one of those rare people that people come to me and say, but what do you think? What do you think about gun control? You know, Should doctors be able to ask parents about firearms in the house? Um, what do you think about alcohol use? What do you think about narcotics? What do you think about Ebola? Like Everybody wants to know what I think, because that's what we do as doctors. We impart advice. Whether good or bad, you come to us for our advice. So I just I think it's really interesting that I, even though technically I'm a journalist, I'm in this unique position where I can speak my mind and do it freely. Well, it's kind of an odd position in journalism because you're supposed to be objective, but clearly health is good. Staying alive is good. <laughs> and so how can you pretend that people being shot by guns is is a neutral fact? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, mentioned this briefly about how uh, you know doctors on the news can give good or bad advice so I was wondering um, how you navigate those boundaries when do you put your foot down and say no to your producers like that is not a segment I can't do I'm thinking a lot about like Dr. Oz for example yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not even that, but like, you know, there's so many 
be doctors on the news, and some are held more accountable than others, and each person has their own kind of like level of like accountability that they hold themselves to. And so how do you negotiate that? And really, I would like you to comment on Dr. Oz. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I don't like disparaging other on-air doctors. Dr. Oz is in a whole other category <laughs> of his own, I think. Um, and, you know, I, I personally feel as though I have a responsibility to viewers to give credible advice, to give advice that is founded in science, where it is evidence-based, where we have experience. And I can say studies have shown this, that, and the other thing. I don't go out there and tout, you know, raspberry ketones. <laughs> raspberry ketones or quinoa or whatever. I like, I like quinoa. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, I think different, different people have different agendas. And I would say it's the rare journalistic doctor, in my experience, who sort of has that bent to sort of out to make money and make a name for himself. And I have never been called to testify in front of the Senate or anything like that. <laughs> that um, and I hold my reputation. My reputation is so important to me. So it is very important that I'm not out there touting a particular treatment or supporting a particular drugstore chain or a, you know, a drug company or you know, even when I talk about Tylenol, I make sure I say acetaminophen, also commonly known as Tylenol. You know, because you don't want to give that impression that you are being bought by anyone or you're getting payments from anyone, because some people are. And uh, I personally think it is bad medicine and it's irresponsible and it's immoral. But without naming any names, <laughs> oh, it's a, it's I think generic. it's a shame. <laughs> Oh, well, you know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I like Dr. Rose. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm not torn at all. It's just, it's, I think where it comes up for me isn't so much in my writing work. It comes up for me in the office. When patients come in, you know, with the, you know, goji berries, and they come in and they tell me they want to get all their fillings pulled out. Really? Yeah, because of the mercury. Or they want to know if maybe instead of, you know, whatever, they're going to try the coffee enemas because they saw it on, on Dr. Oz. And that's a hard conversation. I mean, we, we were talking about this before. Um, you know, I mean, Dr. Oz is just mostly, I mean, he's an entertainer. You know, people see him as... But they see, but they see him... Doctor. Right, I mean, we, you know, don't you think that oh, this is part of a larger theme? We now have politics as entertainment, we have medicine as entertainment. <laughs> Not to mention any names. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know... Where do you go with your lip butt? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. But you know, it's hard because if you say to somebody, you know, what you read about goji, you know, you, you saw goji berries on Dr. Oz, and you went out and bought them. Like, how stupid is that? Well, this does not further the therapy. <laughs> Because, you know, when somebody, you know, buys some potion that they've seen on TV, they may, you know, they may they could get a placebo effect. They could, they could get a placebo effect, but they're looking for something. You know, it's, it's coming out of an honest need and desire that's being met by a huckster. And that's, you know, talk about old themes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's as old as time. You know, we had, used to have snake oil salesmen. Um, so it's a tough one to be respectful to the person who comes to you with something that you don't respect. It's a great way to put it. But so also it's really important, I think, for me to maintain the respect of my colleagues. And it sounds like Dr. Oz has lost respect for yeah. his colleagues at Columbia. But, but I, I always think to myself, again, when that children's hospital doctor, you know, reached out and said, what do you, you know, what do you, like, I always keep that in the back of my mind, like, would my colleagues 
what give the they same say? advice, what would they say? You know, and that's a really good gauge as to whether you're going in the right direction or not. Yeah. But I still will go. <laughs> so, <laughs> I would think she would try to huff Moji berries. <laughs> Only in direct. It's in your eyes, it's like Oprah's creation. That's right. And so, Dr. Phil, we didn't talk about Dr. Phil. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, we could go on and on. <laughs> actually. But unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Yeah, it went really fast. Uh, yes. Uh, go ahead. Um, you know, medicine in some ways provides a shield behind the white coat. We're able to manage to sort of separate your professional self very well, you know, in, in front of the patient. Journalism seems so much more vulnerable. You're putting your opinions out there. Um, so in this age of branded self, how do you balance your public image and everything that's out there that stays out there forever these days with coming back and living with a family or having that interpersonal relationship with your patient? Um, I have to say, fortunately for me, the two don't, which is maybe why I consider my two professions so separate, because people rarely recognize me at clinic. I mean, I have, huh, okay, I always have a little makeup on, let's like, let's not, you know, kid ourselves. But, you know, I, I have glasses on, I've got scrubs on, I've got a fleece, um, I've got a stethoscope, I'm, I'm looking pretty toe up when I'm at the clinic, probably by design. And I have to say, it actually makes me really uncomfortable if I have discovered after the fact or during the interaction that they have recognized me. I don't like that at all, because I think it does create some sort of weird dynamic between me and the patient. Um, but fortunately, I practice in an area where I think very few people are watching you know, WBZ at 5 o'clock. Um, so I've been able to keep that separation nicely, and I like that. So you're kind of incognito. I am as totally incognito. <laughs> and when someone, I'm like, you recognize this? Like, yeah. <laughs> Well, for me, it's a little different because you know my my you know, thing isn't visual. You know, I'm like have a great face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, um, but um, a lot of my patients read my stuff, and um, you know, somehow, as I say, you know, as I said at the beginning, the separations. Of the various persona, maybe, maybe I've just sort of run out of energy after all these years to keep them separate. When I was a young doctor, it was very important to me to wear a white coat and for my patients never to call me by my first name uh, and to not reveal any information uh, about my personal life to my patients. Um, and all of those walls for me have broken down. Um, you know, as the years have gone by, appropriately, I hope. But in any given patient interaction, again, appropriately, um, you know, we might be talking about something the patient read that I wrote, and then of course they've got to see the pictures from my daughter's wedding. <laughs> because they asked. Not that I want to show them. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, and then it's focused on them. But see, I'm, I'm in a very nice position in that, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 25 years. A lot of my patients I've known almost that long. And so the, the sort of role barriers between us have broken down. I mean, these wedding pictures, you know, they remember when that little girl was a baby. Um, so, you know, it's a great question. Though. So, are you accepting new patients? Sounds <laughs> <laughs> great to me. Only oh, 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 if you look at all of the weddings. <laughs> <laughs> and there are 950. <laughs> so, no, if you didn't have a chance to ask your question, I'm really, really sorry. I don't know if these guys can, despite their busy schedule, stick around for just a few minutes oh, sure. after after we wrap. Um, and I just want to thank you both so much for coming and for sharing your lives, your work lives, and your internal lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.